Opinions expressed herein are subject to change and not necessarily the opinion of the firm. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. The information presented herein is for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide personal investment advice. It is important that you consider your tolerance for risk and investment goals when making investment decisions. Investing in securities does involve risk and the potential of losing money. The material does not constitute research, investment advice, or trade recommendations. And now introducing Mr. Keith Lanton. Hi, good morning. August 31st, last day of August. Got Labor Day next week. Lots going on in financial markets, which is a mirror of a lot that's going on in the country. So uh, we'll talk about some different thoughts this morning. I'm going to talk about a follow-up to last week where I discussed some uh, critical habits and one of which was getting enough sleep in this morning and to talk about uh, why sleep is so critically important, some interesting studies and some interesting thoughts on sleep. Uh, and then we'll uh, talk about this morning's news and we'll talk about some articles from Barron's. Uh, Barron's this week had a headline story uh, discussing the municipal market. Uh, Brad and I discussed it uh, yesterday. I'll talk a little bit about it and then I'll turn things over to Brad to talk some more about that and some other uh, commentary from Barron's as well, some interesting uh, thoughts, some ideas, and uh, share it all with you this morning. read a book entitled Why We Sleep. It was written by Matthew Walker and goes through some things that are somewhat intuitive uh, to us. Uh, nevertheless, uh, intuitive that uh, sleep is critically important, intuitive that we need to get a lot of it, but it's something that uh, many of us, uh, although we know it fundamentally, nevertheless uh, don't practice uh, what we know. So one of the things to think about that uh, we discussed that sleep is a critically important habit, helps us think better, among other things. Um, Mr. Walker, who wrote the book, uh, said that uh, that he, who has dedicated his life to studying sleep in particular, is convinced that getting enough sleep is a huge advantage in life. And some of the things uh, to think about with sleep, uh, scientific studies uh, have demonstrated, and uh, Mr. Walker has uh, has uh, summarized them that uh, there is a very direct correlation that the shorter you sleep, the shorter your lifespan. And that sleep is the most effective thing we can do to reset our brain and body and health each day. And interestingly, many of us have heard of a circadian rhythm, which is the rhythm largely uh, set uh, by our bodies, and it is uh, largely dictated by our exposure to light and a gland uh, in the back of the uh, back of the eyes that is in the brain that perceives how much light we are experiencing and uh, and is one of the signals to our body to begin sleep and this is the uh, circadian ry- rhythm. Now, many people who have trouble sleeping, he points out, often take uh, a, a supplement um, which is melatonin. Um, melatonin helps regulate that circadian rhythm. And that's why if you're having trouble sleeping, sometimes you thought that melatonin will help. Um, but what he points out, which is very interesting, is that melatonin is effective, and in some cases highly effective in helping uh, individuals sleep um, who have experienced uh, changes in time zones um, where the circadian rhythm is thrown off because that exposure to light is thrown off. Um, but what he uh, goes through many scientific studies pointing out that uh, while melatonin helps regulate that cir- circadian rhythm, um, that uh, melatonin has very little influence on the generation of sleep itself. So if your problem is not uh, difficulty sleeping because your circadian rhythm is off, which in many cases it's not unless you've been traveling frequently or have another reason that your circadian rhythm is off, perhaps you're a uh, uh, working the night shift, um, that many who are taking melatonin uh, are not taking it for the right reasons and any benefit that they may be experiencing is a placebo effect. One of the things that does trigger your brain to sleep is a chemical that builds up throughout the day, a hormone um, called adenosine. Um, and this builds up throughout the day in your body. Um, almost picture it like, uh, like something that's going to reach a tipping point. And once the adenosine reaches a certain level, you become tired and sleepy. And one of the uh, great stimulants that uh, many of us are addicted to is caffeine. And what caffeine does is it blocks the receptors for adenosine. And that is one of the reasons why, probably the primary reason why caffeine helps you stay awake, um, is that caffeine is blocking your body's ability 
uh, to uh, to regulate that adenosine and feel tired. One interesting note about caffeine is that uh, some of us process caffeine a lot quicker than others, meaning that uh, our livers uh, oftentimes are very uh, uh, efficient in removing caffeine from the body, and that is individuals who are um, less uh, susceptible to having caffeine keep them awake at night. Um, you may experience uh, some individuals uh, very often uh, uh, can drink a cup of coffee and can uh, have a good night's sleep, um, and they can have that cup of coffee late in the day, and perhaps uh, those are the individuals who are uh, able to flush the caffeine out of their system quicker, and the adenosine um, is able to be recognized by the body. One other thing that uh, many of us uh, who are uh, getting older may realize is that the body uh, becomes less efficient regardless of how good your liver is at removing caffeine from the body as we age. So a few more thoughts on sleep, and then we'll talk uh, about uh, what's going on in the markets today. Um, interesting, uh, as I was thinking about uh, discussing this uh, with you this morning, um, over the weekend, New York Times um, had a big article on athletes. And what athletes uh, are discovering in this time of pandemic is that they are achieving personal best in their backyard at a time when they uh, are not uh, are not participating in as many uh, as many uh, events and what uh, what uh, scientists are uh, saying that uh, one of the greatest benefits and the reason athletes are able to achieve greater heights right now is because they are sleeping more they are not uh, traveling the globe and uh, and uh, keeping themselves uh, weary even though they are competing um that uh, that is something that uh, they are suffering from a less or a lack of sleep. And what the athletes are finding is that when they sleep uh, more, they're able to perform better. The body is able to uh, rejuvenate itself quicker. Um, the other interesting thing about athletics and the mind is that the brain during uh, sleep and dream state sleep um, is able to uh, create connections and circuitry and create more uh balance and create more um, adroitness and dexterity um, when performing an action um, when you sleep. So there are lots of benefits to athleticism outside of just rejuvenation that are taking place in the brain um, when an athlete uh, when an athlete rests. And this doesn't apply just to athletes. The same process applies to anyone whether you're in uh, whether you're in uh, school and you're studying for a big exam. Um, the Mr. Walker points out that one of the greatest uh, misnomers um, is pulling an all-nighter um, where you stay up all night and uh, cram for an exam. Um, and he does point out that if you know absolutely close to nothing, that that probably does have a positive uh, cost-benefit because uh, if you know nothing and you go to sleep, there's nothing for the brain to process. But if you know a good amount of information and you're trying to get the, that final uh, final amount crammed into your brain, um, there's a very good chance, uh, extraordinarily high, that you're being counterproductive. Um, that by not sleeping, you're not able to uh, form the connections in the brain to to take that studying and uh, and turn it into uh, actionable uh, results the following day. So that sleep uh, critically important to process information, um, to be able to speak more intelligently, to be able to write more intelligently. Uh, sleep is uh, is the key ingredient that uh, connects a lot of the dots that we uh, that we build during the day. Well, sleep is the uh, the factor that helps our brains uh, not not only uh, recognize those dots but connect those dots. And if we miss sleep, uh, we're unable to connect those dots. And one final thought, and uh, and then I'll end it on sleep, is that uh, many of us think that we can catch up on sleep. So we only got five hours of sleep tonight, but uh, tomorrow night we're going to get ten hours, and then we'll be good again. Um, you may be good again in the sense that you don't feel as tired when you catch up in sleep, uh, but the connections in the brain do not get made up for. So if you get five hours of sleep um, and you miss, uh, miss out on con- making some brain connections, uh, getting 10 hours the next night is not going to he- help forge those connections which were lost. So less sleep, lack of sleep one night does not translate into anything that can ever be gotten back again. Uh, is what Mr. Walker points out. So uh, something to think about when you think, "Hey, I'll just uh, I'll just uh, make it up later." Um, you are, are unable to uh, make that up uh, in terms of uh, the benefits of sleep. Uh, you won't get those back. All right. So hopefully everyone's well rested, and hopefully everyone will be well rested this week and uh, be able to uh, have a much more productive, 
uh, week this week as well as uh, as well as every week going forward um, with that knowledge. So this morning we are looking at a market that uh, has continued to power higher. Um, Barron's ran an article uh, this morning. Uh, the stock market is a run- runaway train of that nothing can stop. Um, saying that uh, last week may go down as the week that the stock market officially went crazy. You wouldn't know it from looking at the major indices, which were higher, uh, but not off the charts, uh, higher, but uh, meaningfully higher. Dow was up 723 points, 2.6%. Um, looking at the S&P, it was up 3.3% to 3508. Um, put that 3508 in perspective, you may remember Goldman Sachs when the market was around 3250, came out and raised their target for year end on the S&P to 3600 from 3000. That was viewed as somewhat aggressive at the time, and here we are almost at that level just a few weeks later. NASDAQ was up 3.4% to 11,695. Both the S&P and the NASDAQ closed at all-time highs. Um, Even the small cap Russell 2000 finished the week up 1.7%. Russell continues to lag uh, the other indices, small and mid-cap stocks continue to lag the large-cap stocks, uh, which are uh, fang-heavy, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So last week, what happened? Well, we had uh, Apple and Tesla racing higher ahead of their splits. Uh, Both stocks are trading post-split this morning. Um, Apple this morning uh, is trading around 126 uh, per share. Tesla's around 446 per share. Uh, Put that in perspective, Apple's up a little over a point. Tesla is up about three and a half points pre-market. Four for one and five for one respective uh, splits. Um, also last week, uh, we had an interesting pair teaming up to possibly bid on the U.S. operations of TikTok, which was uh, um, Microsoft and Walmart uh, getting together. And then on top of that, last week, we had uh, Salesforce.com, symbol CRM. Um, it initially moved up in the beginning of the week uh, by being added to the Dow. And then on Wednesday, uh, they came out with uh, earnings uh, after uh, rising about 3.5% on the Dow ad. And then the stock soared 26%. Uh, now, the uh, author here uh, in the Barron's article, Ben Levison, points out uh, that uh, that kind of move in a large cap stock um, like uh, like Salesforce is something that uh, is something you see when there is uh, market froth or an overheated market. Um, when you see a stock like uh, Salesforce shoot up 26% uh, on earnings, um, despite the fact that they had a meaningful earnings beat, uh, nevertheless, uh, that sort of uh, that sort of uh, run up is something that uh, has uh, has some people uh, reminding them of uh, events in uh, in 2000 um, when you saw earnings come out and crazy reactions in uh, in stocks that you thought uh, the markets were efficiently uh, valuing. Um, article also talks about a strategist at Bank of America, Savita Subramanian. Um, and uh, the strategist at B of A uh, points out that uh, even though uh, equity markets are high um, over the long term, equity markets uh, remain the asset uh, choice um, over the long term. Um, points out that there is a 46% chance of losing money in any one day if you invest in the S&P 500, but only a 6% chance of losing out money in the S&P 500 if you hold for a 10-year time period. And then he goes on to remind us uh, of the fact that uh, if you miss out on just the few best days of the year, uh, that your percentage gains from holding the S&P 500 are dramatically uh, lower. A couple of uh, news items uh, this morning. Um, we are seeing uh, Gilead in the news, GILD, the FDA expanding the use of uh, remdesivir to treat all hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Over the weekend, we had some more uh, politically charged violence, uh, this uh, this time in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, AT&T in the news, they are in uh, early talks uh, to sell their direct TV business. Uh, Wall Street Journal reporting that Apollo Global Management may be interested. Um, journal citing, uh, citing potential uh, price there um, of, uh, of a valuation of around $20 billion dollars. Um, that's uh, that's not confirmed, but uh, AT&T uh, on the equity side, there was also a big debt component uh, when they bought DirecTV, uh, paid about $49 billion for it um, just over five years ago. So be a significant difference if that were the uh, price point uh, there. 
Um, U.S. Treasuries are trading mixed. The two-year is down two basis points. It's yielding 13 beeps. Ten-year is up one basis point to 74 beeps. Uh, U.S. dollar index uh, continuing to trend lower, down two-tenths of one percent. Um, West Texas Intermediate is up uh, 50 cents of one plus percent to $43.47 a barrel. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway uh, in the news bidding up uh, slightly this morning. Um, news that the company invested $6 billion in five Japanese companies. Uh, that is helping uh, the Japanese market uh, move higher this morning. Um, we are seeing uh, weakness, uh, modest weakness in the Hang Seng and the uh, China Shanghai Composite. Uh, China had their PMI number come out a little weaker than expected. Um, also weakness in uh, Australia and South Korea as well. Um, in Europe, we're seeing uh, markets modestly higher. Um, the FTSE is closed for a bank holiday, um, but the other major European Averages all trading slightly to the upside as well. What do we have going on this week? Um, today we have Zoom Video Communications uh, reporting their quarterly results. Um, then tomorrow, the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Australia announcing its monetary policy decision expected to keep rates unchanged. Then tomorrow we get construction spending. We get Supply Institute for Supply Management coming out with their uh, uh, manufacturing Purchases manage, Management Index uh, for August. On Wednesday, we get our first peak at uh, August uh, Employment, um, where ADP is releasing its National Employment Report. Um, ADP report is expected to show that uh, that uh, the uh, total non-farm private sector employment is expected to jump by 1.1 million after adding uh, 167,000 jobs in July. Um, and then uh, on Friday, we get the official unemployment report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, that number will be closely watched. Expectations there for the economy to add one and a half million jobs, um, for the unemployment rate to uh, move down to uh, 10%, um, and that would leave the unemployment rate six and a half percentage points above the pre-pandemic level of three and a half percent. So let's talk uh, pandemic and the effects of the pandemic and talk about two articles in Barron's. Um, the headline story front page of Barron's, uh, entitled The Trillion Dollar Budget Hole, um, talking about states and cities and municipalities and the effect of the pandemic on municipal bonds. And then we'll talk about the New York City office market, uh, two articles in Barron's. Um, noteworthy, I was talking to, uh, Brad on, uh, on Sunday, yesterday, and we were talking about this article. Noteworthy that the cover story of Barron's talking about the municipal market. Um, Brad pointing out to me um, last time the Barons really took a, a strong stand on the municipal market. They talked about Puerto Rico, and uh, their concerns seem prescient. Um, this article, um, my take uh, is uh, it's a warning shot, not necessarily a uh, uh, a, a conclusion um, that uh, that all is hopeless in the municipal market, but nevertheless a warning that uh, if actions aren't taken and if you don't uh, position your portfolio uh, towards stronger credits that uh, you may suffer some distress in the municipal sp space. Um, article starts out talking to Richard Ravitch, uh, who uh, has uh, lots of notoriety in the municipal space, uh, in particular for helping pull New York City from the brink of bankruptcy in the 70s. Um, he says in this article that uh, what he's seeing in uh, municipalities in the present situation as a result of COVID-19 is significantly worse than what he's seen in the past. Um, and he says it's worse because the revenue shortfall is uncertain and horrific. Um, he says there's an enormous loss of revenue going on, and we don't know how long it will last. Um, Barron's points out, try telling that to the $3.9 million market for municipal bonds. Um, in fact, um, municipal bond prices have surged throughout the pandemic, the result of the sector's solid performance in previous period of stress. Now, as Brad has previously pointed out, yields right now are very low on municipals. Um, it's about seven-tenths of one percent for top-rated 10-year munis. Um, but uh, as he's also pointed out, uh, that is uh, relatively attractive when you're looking at a 10-year treasury yielding 74 basis points. So when you take into account the uh, tax benefits, uh, although the yields are very low, they are attractive relative to the alternative. Um, but this article points out that the alternative is not very attractive either. So the question comes down to are yields uh, high enough to compensate investors for r the risks? And, uh, you know, the uh, conclusion here is uh, is maybe, and we'll talk about what maybe means and uh, where risk uh, reward might be 
still attractive and where risk reward um, is in the author's opinion unattractive. So let's take a look at the uh, the macro picture. The macro picture is that states are facing a budget shortfall of 555 billion for the next three years. Um, cities about 360 billion for the next three years. You put that together, and you're north of 900 billion. Um, that's a huge number. Um, that we're looking at in terms of a shortfall, but relative to the types of stimuluses that we've seen and the packages that we've seen out of Washington, um, if there was uh, some uh, some some meaningful help to the uh, to the cities and states, um, then that uh, may go a long way in alleviating uh, some of these shortfalls. On the flip side, if there is not a lot of help, um, then we need to uh, be very vigilant, and that's what we're going to focus on with the assumption that uh, the cavalry from uh, the Fed and from um, Washington, the central uh, government, is federal government is not going to ride to the rescue because uh, we don't know if that, in fact, is going to happen. So the so the one thesis of the article is uh, the muni market, uh, on the whole, remains a relatively safe port in the world of uh, bonds, uh, meaning that uh, the stronger credits and what stronger credit is is somewhat uh, subjective, but that the stronger credits, um, even even in a uh, even in a uh, you know a, a stress scenario. Uh, remain credit good, um, but uh, when we when we move down the, the chain and we look at uh, the weaker credits, uh, that's where there is uh, significant concern, especially because the weaker credits are now trading um, very uh, rich relative to historic metrics. Um, if you take a look at double B or lower rated municipal bonds, um, at the start of the pandemic, they were yielding 7% over uh, AAA rated munis. Um, and there was lots of compensation for risk. In fact, Barron's uh, thought that the risk reward was good. Uh, but now we're looking at the spread of just 3% or 300 basis points, and Barron's is suggesting that the risk reward is not good. Talking about a uh, couple of uh, other factors in the article, if you're looking um, what are the best states and what are the worst states, um, Barron's uh, went out to eat in Vance, um, and Eaton Vance uh, gave their opinion or ranking on uh, on on who the best states are and who are the states to be most concerned about. Um, top five states uh, that Eaton Vance uh, uh, came up with were Idaho, Wyoming, South Dakota, Utah, and Nebraska. And when you take a look at the uh, weakest five states, uh, the list was Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, New Jersey, and at the bottom of the list, uh, Illinois. So some food for thought in the municipal space. Anyone wants to take a look at that article, be happy to uh, send it out. Um, also, talking pandemic, um, sticking with uh, uh, the, the largest city in the country, New York City, uh, Barron's uh, ran an article talking about New York City office space and how to gamble on a recovery. Um, article points out that less than 10% of Manhattan's 1.2 million office workers are estimated to have returned to work. Um, J.P. Morgan, for example, was hoping to have... Uh, uh, the majority of its workforce back in the office uh, by Labor Day. Uh, those ambitions have been scaled back dramatically, and uh, they do not uh, anytime soon now expect to uh, even return to a 50% uh, occupancy. So Barron's talked about the three REITs that have the largest uh, office exposure uh, to the New York market. Um, these are Vornado Realty Trust, VNO, SL Green, symbol SLG, and Empire State Realty Trust, ESRT. Uh, they say that based on cash flow, all three of these New York REITs trade cheaply. Uh, they amount to a speculate, speculative bet on a post-pandemic recovery. Um, they say a vaccine would uh, be a sure way to give a lift uh, to the office market and certainly to uh, New York City's economy. Um, I'm going to talk uh, specifically on Vornado, VNO. I thought that one looked like it had the uh, best risk reward, just my opinion. Um, and uh, this is uh, perhaps appropriate only for those who believe uh, that uh, New York uh, City, the craziest place on earth perhaps, is down but not out, um, and that uh, therefore this is a long-term buying opportunity. Patient investors could be rewarded um, given that uh, Vornado has, uh, have sta has staying power. Um, Vernado is sitting on more than $2 billion in cash, thanks in large parts to its huge success with a residential condominium project near Central Park. Uh, that development may net about $3 billion in sales and $1 billion in profits. Vernado recently reached a deal to lease to Facebook, a uh, new low-rise building with 730,000 square feet uh, within the gigantic James Farley Post Office building near Penn Station on Manhattan's west side. 
Renato is also overhauling two large buildings around Penn Station as part of a $2 billion project in the area to take advantage of the success of the nearby Hudson Yards uh, development. Also, Renato is testing the Manhattan market as it seeks a potential buyer for a large midtown office building where it is a 70-30 partner uh, with the uh, Trump organization. Uh, Pre-pandemic, it was thought the building was worth somewhere between one and a half and two billion dollars. Um, if you're taking a look at the dividend of Vernado, Vernado is now yielding about 5.7 percent, um, and that is after a 20 percent reduction in its uh, dividend um, as a result of the effects of the pandemic. Uh, Vernado gets about 20 percent of its profits from retail store leases, which are under pressure amid bankruptcies and a collapse in tourism. Nevertheless, the uh, article concludes the balance sheet is good. Vernado has enough cash to pay for the Penn Station District building renovations, um, but the warning is that uh, the financial projections keep coming down as the uh, pandemic uh, goes on. So uh, Vernado, uh, before this article was written, was trading around 3680 uh, It is down 45% year-to-date. Uh, market value is about $7 billion, and uh, mentioned that the dividend yield um, which is always subject to change, is yielding about 5.7%. Talk a little bit about Apple. Um, Apple uh, stock split uh, 4 for 1 goes into effect today. Um, in theory, stock splits like this don't mean much um, because the market capitalization doesn't change. We've all heard about that $2 trillion level. Um, but it turns out that stock splits matter more than you think. The last time Apple split its stock was in 2014 when it split 7 for 1. Um, put things in perspective, if Apple, since 1987, had never split its stock, the current share price would be around 28000 Um Apple says the decision to split the stock reflects the desire to make the stock accessible to a broader base of investors. With the most recent split, the share count, count of Apple goes up to 17.1 billion shares. Um, in a research note on Friday, Morgan Stanley analyst Katie Huberty noted that Apple shares have historically outperformed the S&P 500 by 21 percentage points in the three months ahead of the split date. Um, and the stock has also outperformed after splits by 700 basis points after three months, so 7% after three months, and 6.1% or 610 basis points after six months. Uh, we'll see what happens here. Um, worth noting that... Uh, a trust controlled by Tim Cook received 560,000 shares of Apple on August 24th. This was the result of uh, Apple's strong stock performance and a uh, and a vesting that was uh, that was uh, uh, given to him uh, several years ago. If the stock performed well, so he received 560,000 shares on August 24th, and on August 25th, as part of an automatic uh, sell program, 10B51 plan. Um, he sold 265,000 of those shares for 131.8 million dollars. His average sale price was 496.91. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Cook at least is taking uh, some of his money off the table. He still has uh, lots of uh, Apple stock. A couple of other stocks uh, to talk about this morning. A um, couple in the uh, global high tech space. Um, these are other stocks that have uh, been uh, putting up a very large performance uh, uh, numbers, uh, beating the indexes significantly, um, and uh, got uh, these stocks to mention to you from an article with an interview um, with uh, two stock pickers from Jackson Square Partners mentioned in Barron's Patrick Fortier and Brian Tolis. A um, couple of stocks that uh, have been moving uh, under the radar um, outside the United States uh, uh, mentioned two of them. Uh, one of them is Adyen, uh, symbol is A-D-Y-E-Y -E here in the U.S. Adyen is a payment company based in the Netherlands. They're replacing the payments gateway, the processor, and the merchant acquirer, and they're issuing product as well. These are companies, uh, this company has a platform that covers online payments and in-store payments. Its clients include Uber, Spotify, Subway, uh, and McDonald's. Um, a lot of these companies transact business uh, online in many different currencies, and they say that Adyen has a uh, product that is superior to a lot of its competitors um, to enable companies uh, to process transactions in multi-currencies um, and to detect fraud uh, with a greater uh, accuracy um, than, uh, than some of their uh, competitors. Adyen is growing payment volumes more than 50%. Um, it's uh, profitable, and they have 40% uh, operating margins. I will mention that uh, the stock price has skyrocketed in this uh, most recent run-up in tech stocks. 
Um, so uh, if you're looking at, uh, it certainly has been a strong performer. Uh, another stock that's been uh, moving up significantly, um, that's an international stock, hasn't gotten as much attention here in the United States, is Billy Billy. Uh, symbol is B-I-L-I. Um, and what Billy Billy is, is it's a Chinese company with an online video platform similar to YouTube. It's very popular with Gen Z in China and rapidly growing its user base and content breadth. Again, stock has uh, moved up significantly um, in the last several months. And finally mentioned in this article, a U.S.-based company, um, which they say is uh, largely misunderstood in their opinion, is, uh, is Uber Technologies, U-B-E-R. Um, its poor governance has been well documented in the press. Uh, nevertheless, they're optimistic on Uber's long-term potential. Um, particularly now, they uh, are optimistic about Uber Eats, which is growing rapidly, and they think the consumer behavior has changed and that people will be uh, choosing Uber Eats uh, regardless of if there's a pandemic or not. And uh, they think that uh, the ride-sharing business uh, will be a business that uh, turns around very quickly um, once uh, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, is in the rear view middle mirror. Um, they say uh, Uber is well positioned, has a robust business model around ride sharing, and long term, in their opinion, it is a quote amazing opportunity. So that's everything I've got. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brad to uh, give us some more insights uh, on the uh, bond market. Uh, Brad uh, could have helped write that uh, Barron's article. So interested in uh, Brad's uh, insights uh, this morning. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Keith. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone had a good weekend. Uh, can't believe that the summer has flown so quickly, even though every day seems like such a long day because of COVID uh, and, and, and just uh, the insanity that's going on. Uh, the insanity is obviously hitting home now uh, to the municipal bond market. Uh, I never, I'm never happy when I see municipals as a headline on any periodical because it's usually not good news. I'm not saying that there aren't positive articles on uh, municipal bonds, but those are usually reserved for the inside market participants, the traders, the institutional buyers, uh, people of that nature. Uh, when when usually uh, a sell off is overdone and uh, and and. You come on, you come and see, you come in and you start seeing positive articles about municipals, uh, being oversold. At this point, we're certainly not oversold. Uh, we have been, tra we have been rallying with, uh, treasuries and, uh, the rates of return are, are low for municipals. However, as Keith said earlier, and I've said the last few weeks, relative to everything else, uh, on an after tax basis, there's still uh, the cheapest thing around if you're going to be buying bonds for a portion of your portfolio. So the municipalities are going to have to make some tough decisions here. Uh, they're going to have to determine what kind of layoffs they're going to have, have to make to meet budgets. Uh, they're going to, there are going to be votes, uh, for issuance of bonds, which, uh, taxpayers may not want to, to pay for at this point. So you may have deteriorating services. Um, but there's no question that municipalities are still going to try to take advantage of these low rates. And uh, with the Fed backstop, uh, there will still be issuance. I say this every week. Review your portfolio. Make sure you're comfortable with what you have for down the road. Um, it's, it's interesting. As I, do my, as, as I write my offering pages uh, every morning, there are more and more bonds that have material events uh, listed on them. And we're all going to have to get comfortable with that as the new, the new normal. Uh, I know many of you have been looking to buy bonds without material events, which is uh, wise. Uh, there are bonds out there that still haven't been hit, but eventually, uh, more than likely, everybody will every every issuer will be put on some form of credit watch. It doesn't mean that anything's going to happen. I mean, the U.S. government was downgraded, so. It, it ultimately doesn't have to mean anything just because you go on negative watch. Um, my thought is that if you get downgrades, that everything will seem to stabilize at in the triple B range. And when you really think about what the triple B range means, for municipal, we have gotten very comfortable with buying double A rated bonds. Uh, that seems to be the gold standard. Uh, but when I look at what's rated triple B in the corporate world, you look at American Express and Wells Fargo and Goldman Sachs, they're all in that S&P triple B range. And most people wouldn't think 
twice about putting those in their portfolios. So that's where we're going to get to potentially in municipals, and that's what we're going to live with. And hopefully at that point, uh, you'll get paid a little bit more, uh, and you will stabilize with that triple B range. And uh, at a certain point when the pandemic subsides, we will bounce off the bottom uh, and, and start seeing upgrades again, like we do in every cycle. Uh, just going back to those corporate bonds, I mentioned American Express, Wells Fargo, Goldman. When I look at those bonds, to me, they look as if they trade like a double-A rated bond, not a triple B bond. So all triple B, not all triple Bs are not, are the same, not all double A's are the same. So it's definitely important to do your homework, and a lot of homework with municipalities is logic. What's, what's the community, what's community composed of? How's the school district? Uh, what, what kind of business, what kind of enterprises in the community? And those are the kind of things that we're going to be discussing. And, uh, the last thing that I want to mention is, uh, we've started looking at insured bonds again. And, uh, for many years, the insurance companies, uh, disappointed us, uh, because they got in above their heads in areas other than municipals. But the insurance companies who are insuring municipal bonds at the moment seem to be relatively stable. And I don't mind uh, looking at bonds with, with insurance, and I would take that to heart. If you're buying a small community, it's nice to have uh, that insurance wrap around it. Uh, so that's all that I have for this week. Thank you, Brad. That's everything I've got. Thank you for listening to Mr. Keith Lanton. For more podcasts, please visit our website, www.lanternwa.com.